GearNetwork.com. The following is a presentation of the Gear Radio Network. Hey guys, I'm Felissa Rose Angela from Sleepaway Camp, and you're listening to the All Bets Are Off with a Robbie Vegas podcast. Rockers, and welcome back to another episode of the All Bets Are Off podcast. And today, my guest is here straight from Friday the 13th, part two, Laura Marie Taylor. How are you? I'm super, Robbie. Thank you. How are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. Thank you for making the very long drive. It's a pleasure. It's great to be here. I haven't been where we are in a really long time, and it was a great trip, and I'm just really happy that you're having me in your uh, pod space. <laughs> so thank you for inviting me. Yeah, of course. So you kind of told a few stories already, so we're, we're kind of <laughs> already rolling here so now we're just making it official so i might ask you to repeat some things that's okay but um i kind of want to start back at the beginning so how old were you when you started acting well if i tell you that i'm giving away my age <laughs> fair we okay. could strike the question <laughs> no um well i started doing uh tv commercials when i was in high school i was doing a lot of musicals and plays and the of course, all boys school next to mine. <laughs> and one of the shows was Oklahoma and another actress by the name of Ali Sheedy was also in the show with me. I, of course, was playing the comic relief and she was playing the beautiful heroine, tragic heroine. <laughs> and her manager was in the audience and they came up to me. She came up to me at the end of the um, show and said, have you ever thought about being in TV commercials? And I said, no, I was thinking of being a veterinarian. <laughs> it was far cry. And I met with her the following week, and three weeks later, I was doing all of the Burger King jingles and commercials for the next three years. Oh, wow. So that wasn't something you actually ever really set your sights on doing. No. It just kind of fell into your lap. It fell into my lap. So how did you get the role on Friday the 13th, too? Okay, so I'd been doing all those commercials for, I guess, about two years or so. I wasn't really that far into it. So for about two years, I'd been doing commercials. And a lot of casting directors, just like a lot of directors back you know, in the 70s and whatnot, I just gave away my age. Uh, <laughs> back in the 70s, would graduate, if you will, to casting movies and TV shows, just like a lot of the big directors, like uh, Bob Giraldi, for one, directed, I believe, uh, one of Michael Jackson's videos, one or two of his early music videos. So one of the casting directors that I auditioned for that cast me in a couple of commercials just happened to have been the casting director on Friday the 13th Part 2. So oh, wow. they called my agent. I went in. A week later, I had the part. And it was rock and roll time for me and uh, Jason Voorhees. <laughs> <laughs> so were you a fan of like the horror genre to begin with? or mm -hmm. Oh, you were. So getting cast in that had to be a pretty big deal for you then. It was pretty cool. Um, when I was growing up, we had this series called uh, Creature Feature, where they would show things like Dracula, Frankenstein, anything about a haunted house, um, Godzilla. And of course, there was the Twilight Zone. That was really big. Abbott and, Abbott and Costello always had the haunted house. Yeah. They, I love those old <laughs> Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein and all that. Yeah, 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 it was great. <laughs> Uh, you know, not Josie and the Pussycats, uh, Scooby-Doo, mm -hmm. you know, and his ghost story. So I was really into the whole ghost story and monster thing. There wasn't any serial slasher type of movie yet when mm -hmm. I was growing up. So when I got the script and I'm looking at it, I'm thinking, how are they going to do this? And then Steve Miner said, well you're all going to watch part one so that you know what you're, you're getting into. Mm -hmm. So we went to um, a studio where we were able to, you know, a small studio to watch it on a, you know, small wall sized movie screen, not, nothing to write home about, not mm -hmm. like the, the cineplex is now. And we watched part one there and I don't think it had come out yet. And I sat there and I said, what happened to all these actors? I mean, I was really creeped out by it. I was like, are they still alive? I thought, what if they actually kill you? Right. So I was a little creeped out by doing this. So what was it like when you actually got on set? Were there times where you were actually afraid? Like, was it that intense? Or were you just kind of like, oh, okay, I get it now? <laughs> You're 
talking to somebody who grew up in the Bronx. <laughs> so I'm like a true city girl. And you would think, oh, you can take the girl out of the Bronx, but you can't take the Bronx out of the girl. Yeah. You know, so I was kind of this tough kid, you know, blah, 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 uh, who didn't quite fit in in the private high school that I went to. I was still kind of that tough South Bronx kind of girl. Well, I get up to the camp and I'm just biting my nails. I'm shaking because it's dark. Yeah, right. You grew up in the city. It's never dark <laughs> and it's never quiet. So they... The guys, they just took the opportunity to play pranks on me. And I was just always shaking in my boots. I was just scared all the time. So it didn't take much to get you into the mode of acting scared because you were scared. Not at all. (laughs) And especially since we were filming at the camp at night. Right. And then these guys, you know, Tom McBride, uh, Stu Charno, Bill Randolph, you know, all those guys, Russell Todd, they just were ruthless and teasing me. (laughs) I just... Oh, yeah. I could tell you a story if you want. Yeah, let's okay. hear it. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. So we get there and, you know, we're unpacking and we actually stayed in the cabins on the camp. Oh, did you really? Yeah, that's wow. what was so creepy about it. If I was in a hotel room, then I would just be, you know, looking under the bed and doing normal stuff, like looking in the shower, like Psycho, you know, with Anthony yeah, right. Perkins there. <laughs> you know, I'd be doing normal stuff. But this was in a cabin and we all had our own little cabin areas and I'm putting away my stuff as if I was going to get all dressed up. I had dresses with me and cute stuff like that. I'm putting away my stuff in the closet and I hear scratching on the screen (laughs) of the window. And the next thing I knew I was being told to wake up because I passed out on the floor. Oh really? Yeah. And they were actually smacking (laughs) me in the face. They're like, Come on, come on, get up, get up. I was like, what? What? Ah! And I just <laughs> woke up and I started freaking out. I was like, there's something in the window. And they just looked and said, no, it was us. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so they knew I scared easily. And then it just rolled down from it there. It just <laughs> kept going. You know, booze behind staircases, you know, creepy steps outside my, my door. I, they, they wouldn't stop. Wow. I can't believe they actually had you guys staying in the camp. That would freak me out, too. I mean, you know you're filming a movie, but still you're staying in that, in that camp. Yeah. You know? Did you, like, there was, the first one had come out, and it was huge success. Now you're in the second one. Do you realize how iconic this first one is at this time, or has it not reached that status yet? It had not reached that status yet at all. It okay. was just number one came out. Yeah, you know, people liked it. They flocked to the theaters. Ooh, scary movie. Mm-hmm. Number two comes out. Ooh, let's bring my date and see number two. Get scared. Ooh, she'll jump in my arms. Ah! Yeah, right. <laughs> and so on and so forth. And then they all the other movies started coming out too. Mm-hmm. Screams, you know, more Halloweens started coming out. So it became popular. I had no idea how popular it was until I went to my first convention. Ah, okay. Which Warrington Gillette basically dragged me to. <laughs> so you didn't want to, or you just... I didn't know about them, to tell oh, okay. you the truth. Okay. I was very out of the loop. And he got my number through, I think, my agent at the time. You know, has Lauren, you know, blah, blah, blah. and they gave him my number, and um, which was fine with me. And he said, get over to the Javits Center right away in Manhattan, all the way on the west side. He mm-hmm. goes, get to the Javits Center. You know, you got to come and join us. You know, Bill's here. So-and-so is here. People from part three and five are here. I was like, what are you talking about? I just happened to have been in the city walking around oh, that day. Okay. So I went and it was just such a shock. I had no idea hmm. that it was so beloved in the horror community. And it was yeah. fascinating to me. And you you are in um, probably one of the most beloved ones because it's the first time we see Jason as the killer. So Because mm-hmm. in the first one, it was his mother. You come in for the second one and now the iconic character is born, mm-hmm. essentially. Do you remember what it was like the first time you watched it back in a theater and like saw it all put together? Well, here's the thing. When you watch yourself in a movie <laughs> and the screen is, you know, as big as a house and your face is up there, you just go, oh! Oh no, look at, oh, (laughs) you know, the cringe factor is just so huge when you watch yourself. A lot of people love it. It's like, oh, look at me. I'm a big screen. Look how cool I am. (laughs) I'm watching it. I'm just, I'm just, I have one eye closed like this. Oh, especially with the scene with the brown underwear. That was just, I think I slid under the seat in front of me when my cat, when Vicky pulls out that brown underwear and then does the perfume thing. I just kind of slithered under the face. table. Like, like, I was like, ah, oh God, help me. <laughs> I made sure nobody saw that you were there. <laughs> yeah. But you know, I was really, um, I was busy at the time. I was filming a movie called Neighbors with John Belushi and Dan Aykroyd. I yes. played Belushi's daughter in that. And at the same time, I, w- I was understudying an off-Broadway show in the evening with, funny enough, 
Kevin Bacon from number one. Really? Yeah. Wow. We so never six talked degrees about of Kevin Bacon. It. Exactly. You're linked. I'm, you're, <laughs> we are linked. But it's so funny because we had both done our respective Friday the 13th movies. Neither of us knew about the other one. Really? Being in a Friday movie. Wow. Okay. Which is completely crazy. Yeah. <laughs> so the movie came out while I was doing Neighbors and the Off-Broadway show. So I never even got to see it until about two Saturdays into the theater. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We didn't have like a big fancy premiere or <laughs> anything like that. But it did end up being a big deal. It sold really well. Mm -hmm. And domestic box office was huge for that. So do you remember like seeing that and being like, oh my God, I'm in this huge movie? I think it occurred to me a little bit, mm -hmm. but not really. I think it was because I was in this really incredible space career-wise, moving forward and working with John Belushi and Dan Aykroyd and going out with them in the evenings, too. They'd pick me up after the show, and we would go and see Meatloaf and Adam Ant and, you know, a bunch of other, you know, hard, you know, punk um, uh, rock guys back then whose names have curses in them, so I won't say them because I'm trying to be a good girl. <laughs> <laughs> Explicit, explicit, just like your album. Explicit lyrics. <laughs> Beware. Yeah, I saw you were listening to that on your way here. Thank you, by the way. Oh, you're welcome. It kept me awake, that's for sure. <laughs> so let's talk about Neighbors really quick. How did you end up getting cast for that? Same thing. Just oh, fell into your lap kind of thing? That literally fell into my lap. I hate using the word literally because it's such a cliche and so, you know, like <laughs> three years ago. I was, so I was, um, before I started Neighbors, I was already involved with the off-Broadway show called Album. And Jennifer Grey was doing the role that I was understudying in New York. She was doing it in Chicago at the Apollo Theater. Okay. Well, she had a big birthday, and she had a little accident on her big birthday and got a concussion. So they flew me out to Chicago for a week to take her place. So I took her place, had a great time. You know, it, Adam Baldwin was in it. Alan Ruck was in it. It was just a great time. Came back to New York. No sooner had I opened up the door to my apartment, the phone rings and it's my agent. Lauren, I know you just got back, but you have an audition. I was like, <laughs> I said, what? they said, right now, go over to John Alvidson's apartment, which just happened to have been five blocks away from where I lived. Oh, okay. You're going to go to the top floor. Just ask for him. They're going to be expecting you. Just go. And I said, well, what's it for? And they said, well, it's, you know, for a part in a movie that John Belushi and Dan Aykroyd are doing called Neighbors. And I was like, okay. They said, she said, they've been trying to cast his daughter and they can't find anybody. So that's how that wow, happened. Okay. So I went there and there they are in this big room with the big tables, you know, kind of like what you see on TV, you know, treat everybody reading the treatment of the script and everybody's <laughs> all official and the producers are there and everybody's there and... Little old me comes in, you know, like this, you know, looking like something Jason dragged in from the airplane <laughs> from Chicago. And I walked into the room and I go, hi, I'm Lauren. And Belushi looks up, you know, and he puts the one eyebrow up and he kind of looks at me up and down. And Aykroyd, you know, is sitting there and he kind of looks at me and John Allison says, here, come sit down, you know, I'm going to read. So we open up the script and he goes, turn to page whatever. We're going to read the scene with the candy underwear. That mm -hmm. was my audition scene. Mm -hmm. So we read the scene with the candy underwear. And I just sort of sat there and smiled like yeah. that. And they said, so what were you doing in Chicago? So I told them the whole story. They said, well, did you go to Chicago you know, City Limits? You know, all the I said, yeah, I went to a bunch of different clubs and whatnot with everybody. It was fun. And then he looked at me and goes, you don't know who I am, do you? And I went, <laughs> no, not really. He goes, you've never watched Saturday Night Live. Right. And I said, actually, no. <laughs> I said, usually I'm pretty beat by the time I get home on the weekends from, you know, the understudy gig. I just go right to sleep. And he just, he said, turned around and goes, great, thanks. I like you. So I left, get home, phone rings, get back over there. They're casting you and they want you to sign the contract. Oh, wow. So I ran back over, <laughs> still sweaty and disgusting. <laughs> and that's how I got that role. So you weren't starstruck at all then because you really no. didn't know who you were reading yeah. in front of. Nope. You just knew that there was two guys there that you were auditioning for. Just knew that they were there and it was a great, great time. I, am, I always call it, you know, nothing against my marriage and my kids and my family and everything. But that was one of the best times of my life, especially professionally. It was just so much fun. They were great. Uh, John Belushi was very protective of me, you know, even though there were things going around, obviously, yeah. you know, yeah. in that whole world and that time. 
you know, back in 1981, you know, you know, it, the world was different and a lot the same, but he shielded me from that. You that's, know, he that's didn't, cool he made sh- yeah, yeah, I didn't get involved with any of that. Mm-hmm. And I went to parties. I mean, I was in a limousine with Carrie Fisher. I mean, come on. It was, yeah. <laughs> it was a great time. And it's funny because all these years have passed. And the only time I've talked about it is to tell my adult children stories when their friends come over, they want to hear stories. And like, if you ask me, right. <laughs> otherwise it's like, I don't really talk about it. Right. right. Yeah. Right. Well, <laughs> that brings me to, to my next question though, which is, uh, you were part of a TV series called loving mm-hmm. and that was from 83 to 95. That's a big like, chunk of that, life. Yeah. That's a long time for, well, one for a TV series to continue running, but you were involved with it the whole time. Yeah. From day one. So how did you end up being cast for that role and staying on for so long? <laughs> <laughs> That's another funny story. Well, it's funny to me. It's not funny to anybody else, but maybe somebody will find it slightly <laughs> funny. Um, I had been auditioning for ABC for the different soap operas for a while mm-hmm. and being screen tested for a while. Um, All My Children, One Life to Live. I was tested for another soap opera. So when they were developing this new soap opera, Agnes Nixon was the creator. creator. When they were developing this new one, they wanted a bunch of new faces. Okay. And I had done a small role on Ryan's hope. So ABC knew me, Mm -hmm. you know, I'm reliable. I show up on time. I do my job. I don't mouth off. You know, I'm an, you know, easy going to work with very much a, um, network corporate girl. Mm -hmm. And I auditioned for it. I auditioned for a different role first. And then they called me back for a screen test for the role of Stacy, which is the role I played for all those years. And Chris Markintel, who also got cast as Curtis, we screen tested together. At the end, we decided to ad lib a little bit. So it's just supposed to be one of these argumentative things about, you know, Jack and this person and Lily, you know, the other characters. And then we didn't plan it so much as he said, be prepared. I'm going to ad lib at the end. I said, all right, then be prepared because I'm going to come right back at you. (laughs) Didn't know what he was going to do. At the end of the scene, he grabs me by my hair, pulls me in for a kiss. Mm -hmm. After having this big, quote, argument, (laughs) he pulls away, looks at me, and I smacked him across the face. (laughs) And they said, cut. I went home. The <laughs> phone rang. I don't know what you did, but they already booked you for the role of Stacy. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. And then you had the longevity of staying on for 12 years. Yeah. Right? And I had a lot of opportunity during that time. I hosted uh, morning programs. You know, I would go in and do like the live morning show, like the Cleveland Exchange. Yeah. I did uh, one up here, up in Buffalo years ago. Really? Um, am I supposed to say where we are? Yeah, that's fine. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Up in, uh, yeah, yeah, in Rome, Italy here. <laughs> in my mountaintop. <laughs> in your chalet and next to uh, George Clooney. <laughs> oh, hello, Prince Charles. <laughs> <laughs> That's better. I'll edit out the buffalo part. <laughs> so that led to more opportunities for you just because of the longevity of that show and being so consistently on TV then. Yes and no. A funny thing happened on my way out the door. Because I had been on the show for so long, mm-hmm. When I would, uh, because soap operas are kind of like repertory theater. You can kind of hop around a little bit. When I was done with Loving, I didn't hop to another soap opera. Okay. Um, The genre was starting to slow down a little bit, and they were starting to let their regulars go. And so they were bringing in new blood, if you will. Yeah, okay. (laughs) Fire 13th, new blood. Yeah. Uh, They were bringing in new blood, and that new blood meant younger, younger people. And I, by the time I was off of Loving, I was already in my 30s. Okay. And that was not considered younger people? Not in not in show business. Gotcha. No, okay. no unless you want to play a zombie, <laughs> which I wouldn't mind doing. So I, I, uh, I did a little show on Lifetime at the beginning of Lifetime TV. I did a craft show where I interviewed people, which was kind of fun also. Made the best of that. And then everything just kind of slowed down. I went back, I went back to school, back to college. Okay. Got another degree, got a teaching degree and started teaching first grade. Oh, wow. And okay. did that for 10 years. What a career change. <laughs> it was a huge career change, but I'll tell you, once in a while, more often than not, during parent-teacher conference, when you're that close to the parents and they're listening to your voice... And they're looking at you, I would get the side eye. Yeah. <laughs> how, how do I know you? How do I know you, Miss Lauren? How many people figured it out? Oh, none of them. Oh, really? <laughs> Only one person figured it out, and it was a fellow teacher. Um, but the parents, I just kept saying, well, you know, I have that kind of face. It looks like everybody. <laughs> no, 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 no. I've seen your face somewhere. I, did you, like, 
ever do like, I no, you never did movies or anything like that. No, 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 Miss Lauren, that's not you. No, no, no. <laughs> I was like, yeah, you know, I look like a lot of people. But one day, one of the other teachers came in, and it was when I was ki- teaching kindergarten. She came into my room, and she had very interesting mannerisms. She was very particular and very precise how she would speak and do things. And she sidled up next to me, put her hands in her lap, started clapping her lap like this. <laughs> and she said, so. And I went, so, how's lunch? And she goes, just fine. So, <laughs> this is going to sound really strange, but my brother is a huge horror movie fan. <laughs> I said, uh-huh. And she goes, and I was watching this horror movie with him. And I thought to myself, that really looks like Miss Lauren. And I said, oh, really? <laughs> wow. Which one? She goes, it's Friday's 13th part two. I know it sounds silly. So I looked for the credits and I was looking for your name and your name wasn't up there. But Lauren... It looked exactly like you. (laughs) And I said, well, was the name Lauren Marie Taylor? And she said, yes. (laughs) And I looked at her, I went, yeah. (laughs) I said, that's my maiden name. That's fine. (laughs) (laughs) And she, she, her jaw fell open, her face turned beet red, and then she asked for an autograph for her brother. Oh, that's awesome. So I went home and got one of my old pictures and (laughs) autographed and sent it to him. That's really cool. (laughs) You know, what's interesting to me, too, is I find a lot of people who get started in the genre, especially the slashers, they get, like, typecast, so they just do hundreds of horror movies, whether they're B-movies or straight-to-DVD or bigger movies, it doesn't matter, but that didn't happen to you. You weren't typecast into that role. Did anybody ever try and get you to do that, and you tried to stray from it? Um, Well, I did Girls' Night Out Yes, also, which was in the genre, and I think that went uh, to the movie theaters for two days, and then it went straight to Blockbuster after (laughs) that. But my agency didn't want me to go that route. Okay. Once I got into the business of acting and being on television, I set my sights on being on a soap opera. Gotcha. I grew up with my grandmother watching them, even though I wanted to be a veterinarian. Mm Mm-hmm. That when I became successful and doing a lot of commercials and doing a lot of commercials yeah. and a lot of jingles, it was very lucrative. I paid my way through my first years in college oh, with wow. my commercial money and was able to have an apartment, you know, right out of high school. Yeah. Yeah. And so it was, it was nice. It was really good living. But growing up watching my grandmother watch these shows, when I realized I'm not going to be a veterinarian anymore, I set my sights on wanting to be on daytime television. Okay. So you made, kind of made sure that you didn't get typecast into that, that type of role in a sense, but maybe not intentionally, but yeah, just because you already had an idea of where you were going or where you wanted to go. Yeah. And again, the genre wasn't as rich as it is now or over mm-hmm. the past whatever 20 years yep. you know when they really started making them believe me if they, if they wanted me to be in one of those and be a crazy old lady next door going i saw him i saw him <laughs> i'd love to do it i wouldn't mind i'd do it yeah why not so did you continue to follow the series after your in part two like when they were releasing all the just when they were releasing them yeah. i didn't really um go to see them uh, if they're on TV and I'm, you know, flipping channels and one comes on, I'll watch it out of curiosity. Yeah. I did watch the new one that came out. I think it was a remake oh, of the original. Oh, the remake of the first. It was like the first three rolled yeah. into one. Yeah. I watched that and I, I thought, wow, that's different. <laughs> because I think ours were more pure in a way. Mm-hmm. Um, it wasn't so much about TNA. Right. Whereas... I mean, you couldn't get away from them. I felt like I was going blah, 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 to all yeah, those girls, yeah. you know? It was brutal yeah. nudity. Yeah. Um, everything. I thought, I felt like I was having an affair with all these people. I felt guilty <laughs> watching it. I was like, somebody's going to see me watching this and they're going to tell my husband, I better turn this off. Good ching. And a lot of people don't like the remake. They, mm-hmm. they like the originals, you know? The originals are always going to be their, their bread and butter. So is that the role that you get asked about the most out of everything you've done? Oh, wow. Um, hmm. On the street, I get asked about loving. Yeah. 12 years. <laughs> 12 years, and you're in somebody's living room all the time. Going to conventions, obviously, I get asked about yeah. Friday. So that was that's actually my next question is, uh, when did you find yourself starting to do horror conventions, and are they happening more frequently? Well, because I was teaching. Ah, uh, okay. Right? Okay, yeah. so I was on loving. Mm-hmm. That gig ended, and then Handmade by Design was only on for a couple of years. Go back to school, start teaching. 
you know, boom, 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 not a lot of downtime. I didn't know anybody. Mm -hmm. I didn't know any of the promoters. I didn't know that these things were going on until Warrington called me because I still had my agency because in the summers, you know, teachers have time off, you know, in the summers. So I would do a regional commercial during the summer here and there, Okay, you know, because that has also changed a lot, uh, the whole TV commercial world. So it wasn't until Warrington called me that I knew this existed. Okay. So a lot of everybody who does conventions has somebody who represents them similar to an agent, but not as intense as an agent. They don't like go out and say, all right, you have, you're going to have an audition for this, or we're going to try to get you in this. It's just like, if they're doing Friday the 13th at this convention, they'll call and say, Hey, are you having any part two people? Would you like to have Lauren? Mm -hmm. So I guess because of the teaching schedule, I really didn't start going to conventions until, I don't know, maybe eight years ago. Oh, okay. And then it would be few and far between. Like, I'd do one, and then it would be two years. Oh, okay. Gotcha. I mm-hmm. don't think I ever did two in one year. Maybe once I did two in one year. Mm-hmm. But like I said, if I've done more than six then I'd be surprised. Gotcha. I don't think I've done more than six. They got to be fun, though, when you're meeting yeah. all the fans that are like... I, I know a lot of people I know think part two is the best one. So oh, thanks. you, you you're must be like oh. just getting swamped with people and just yeah. having a blast. You're too kind. You're too <laughs> kind. Well, you know, it, what it, what's fun about it, too, is that the memorabilia... That's a really big word for an actress. The memorabilia. <laughs> I'll just leave it at that. I'll let it roll off my tongue like that. It's the stuff... <laughs> The stuff, the yes. Stuff. <laughs> you know, the books, um, the posters, the posters from around the country, things that people have made, you know, obscure posters, mm-hmm. movie cards, all those things, T-shirts that people, they want you to sign their T-shirts. And then they show you the tattoos that they've got, and that's really cool. Yeah, there's a Jason back there. Oh, there he is. I see him. <laughs> oh, it looks like my, uh, my mask, oh, actually. Yeah. <laughs> the mask looks like my mask. Okay, a COVID-19 mask. Okay, that's what we're talking about. Yes, um, social distancing yes, podcast. Yes, that's what we're talking about here. <laughs> So that's what's fun is to meet the people who are, you know, real fans and see their stuff. And it just gives me great pleasure to be able to do that. And once in a while, somebody with with a neighbor's poster will come. That's cool. And that's really cool. Somebody with a girl's night out poster will come by. And then occasionally you'll get the loving person come in. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> and say, I used to watch you all the time, you know, or my mom watched you. Can you sign a picture for my mm-hmm. mom? And that's, that's always cool. Too. That's awesome. Yeah. So tell me about the tour though. The, the Chris, is it called the Crystal Lake tours? Or what okay. Are they yeah. <laughs> okay. So this was a couple of weeks ago. Um, you know, the conventions have stopped. Yes. Dead. There was supposed to be one March 13th, the weekend of March 13th. And that's the weekend where Everything shut down that following Monday. Yes. So they were anticipating that and things were spreading like wildfire. So I guess the Monster Mania promoters really just thought, we can't risk this. We right. don't want it being traced back to us. Right. Because right. that would give, you know, all of us involved, you know, a bad name. You know, mm-hmm. how could you be so stupid knowing that this, you know, thing is coming and it's coming at people and making people very, very ill. Mm-hmm. So they canceled that. And I guess they kept saying they were going to postpone it. And then it just, I think it's postponed until next year. I'm not sure. So Crystal Lake Tours, I guess they've been doing this for a while now. They have the campsite where Friday the 13th, part one. (laughs) I swear I haven't been drinking. It's really early. Okay. It's not six o'clock yet. Okay. It's six o'clock somewhere else, but I just got here. I swear. (laughs) I'm tongue tied. I'm just so tongue tied. You know, um, anyway, um. So anyway, so Crystal Lake Tours, it's, um, they run, I guess, these tours of the camp and they have places where, you know, this scene was shot, that scene was shot. There's the lake, there's the canoe. That's what it looked like. So they do that. And I guess a couple of years ago, maybe, or maybe last year, they started inviting the actors from part one. Yeah, Yeah. And it was such a huge success because the money that the Camp Crystal Lake Tours group makes, they donate a proceeds of it back to the actual camp camp that is for children. Oh, wow. So, and they have weeks where they have children with special needs. Yeah. So it gives back to the camp. So it's a double thing that's going on there, which is really cool. That's huge. And so this year they reopened it again to have the Friday 13th people, but only on a few weekends in August. And they invited Bill Randolph, who played Jeff, Mm -hmm. uh, who got stabbed in the bed. Yes. (laughs) and 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 they invited me. So again, it was all social distancing. It wasn't 100 people. It was a quarter of the amount because... 
capacity, you're yep. only allowed a certain amount of people. Right, right. So they were working at 25% capacity too. And it was also social distancing. And so what we did, we, there were three sets of tours and Bill and I went on the tours with the fans and chit chatted about part two with them. And, yeah. you know, I told the differences and similarities between the two camps mm -hmm. and whatnot. And, um, then we would do a little meet and greet and sign some stuff. That's cool. And, you know, they had the head of Mrs. Voorhees. <laughs> of course they did. You know, and they, uh, we snapped some pictures and I started screaming for the people for their pictures. <laughs> some of them took videos and that was kind of fun to do that. And it was a good time. I hope, uh, I hope to be able to do it again next year. Do you find yourself being a bigger fan of the genre now than you were back then? Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. So you've kept up on just horror movies in general? In general. Like, mm -hmm. I, you know, of course it's pandemic times and... You so know, you're watching way more. Oh, the <laughs> Contagions, Extinction, yeah. you know, all of them. Anything, like anything, like 28 Days Later, oh, God. Yeah, that's, yeah. It's classic. Yeah. I love that. That was one of the better zombie movies, I think. It was great, and it was just it was so in your face at that time because we hadn't seen anything like that. Yeah, right, absolutely. And, you know, the sh of course, the classics like The Shining, classics, you know, um, Silence of the Lambs, those are, you know, horror slash thriller, but they're mm -hmm. classics. But I'll tell you, 28 Days Later saved my life. Really? How so? I was running in Upper Manhattan mm -hmm. after school one day because I was teaching in um, Upper Manhattan at the time, and Changed my stuff, went for a run after school, and then, you know, pack up my stuff and go home. Mm -hmm. I run across the George Washington Bridge and back. So I'm cooling off, and I'm kind of in a dead zone mm -hmm. in Upper Manhattan. And it was springtime, and I see a guy walking towards me with a long coat. Mm -hmm. I grew up in the Bronx. All right, I know what's coming. I had a feeling. You could just feel the, the hair on the back of my neck was just ready. Yeah. So this guy whips out a blade, 10 inches or so whips it out and starts coming at me. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm in my little running outfit, my little shorts, my little singlet. Look at me, 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 look at me. <laughs> well, all I could think is scare the shit out of this guy. Mm -hmm. So what I do, I did the 28 days later. I looked at him and I just started clapping my hand and going, <laughs> the guy took off. The guy ran away from me. It was, and, I, and I just started running into the middle street and I'm, and I'm walking like this. I'm going, <laughs> And this guy's just, and the look on his face was like, oh shit, I saw that movie. <laughs> you got that? It was great. But it rattled me, of course, but it, I, it, I didn't know what else to do. I was in a little running outfit. I wasn't about to get stabbed. Right. No, that makes sense, though. So you freaked him out. I freaked him out, and right. he went running. And I thought, well, I'm already running, so let me just keep running. <laughs> and I just kept running all the way back to my stuff at school. Right, right. Wow. Jeez, that's, a, that's scary, but also, like, because you use that to get out of it is pretty yeah. entertaining. <laughs> Everything I learned how to take care of myself in a tough situation, I learned from a horror movie. There you go. <laughs> well, so Friday the 13th is probably the birth of the slasher. I know Halloween came first, but mm -hmm. I feel like Friday the 13th was the reason why they started making every slasher in the world and since mm -hmm. and inspired movies like Scream and all that mm -hmm. that came later. So in your opinion, what makes Friday the 13th the biggest one and the, the one that people are just loving more and more as time goes on? In our cases, we're not at home. We're at a camp. At home, you got your phone, you got, you know, your knives in your right. drawer. Maybe you have a concealed weapon that you have a permit for. There's a certain amount of safety at home. You can run out and get a neighbor. Friday the 13th, we're at a camp. There are no phones. There's no place to go. There's no neighbor. There's no police. There's no busy street to wave down a car. Right. You're at a camp. So we're very <laughs> vulnerable. And I think that's what gives it that super duper, oh shit, creep factor. Right. And of course, at the time when the first ones were out, well, maybe pretty much all of them until what, Freddy versus Jason, but there's no cell phones. Nobody was running yeah. to grab their phone or to make a call to the cops. Yeah. You guys were in the middle of nowhere with no phones, no anything. So I don't know, it still freaks you out to watch it to this day. Yeah. And it's my favorite series, and it's still, every time I watch it, I'm like, can you imagine? It's <laughs> you know? scary. Listen, I, when I'm in good shape, really good shape, right now I'm a COVID chonk at the moment, but when <laughs> I'm in super duper shape, I usually do trail running. Okay. And I bring bear spray. Do you think I'm bringing bear spray because of bears? Uh -uh. I'm back there alone. I did a horror movie. I know what to look for. Right, right. <laughs> so what was your favorite kill scene? Was it your own? Um, okay, I will... Ugh, I hate to say this, but Bill Randolph and Marta's with the... 
With the, through the, oh, the impale through yeah, the, the bed. Impale. <laughs> that was bad. That was really bad. Russell Todd's hanging from a tree upside down. Mm-hmm. I mm-hmm. thought that was especially cruel because he's hanging there for so long. Oh, okay. So he was actually like well, up there you know, for a bit. Oh, no, no, in the movie he was. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't sure if, you know, maybe you guys were like, hey, just give us a couple more takes. Can you okay upside down like that? <laughs> I think, you know, it's funny because you would think it would be, well, not to mind you, you don't see a lot of gore. It's all about the screaming and all about Bill Randolph hanging behind me. Yeah. Uh, but you would think it would have been Tom McBride's machete through the head, Mark's right, machete right. through the head. But I was there. When Carl Fullerton was creating that mold, oh, okay. Tom so and I were there at the same it. time. Yeah, so I was watching the whole process, mm-hmm. and then we'd go back and look at the progress. You know, at the blood, the machete in it. It was really cool. Mm-hmm. So I think because of that, because I was such a part—not a part of it—but I was witness to the evolution of the Mark head. Yeah. I yep. didn't find that scary. I was like, oh, yeah, that's the mold. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the latex head, whatever, or whatever <laughs> it was made out of. But the other ones, I wasn't privy to those. So ah, okay. it kind of like, ooh, creep so me out. When it came time to do yours, was there any kind of like nerves or like, was it hard to like get into that mode of like, okay, I'm about to be killed and I have to do, <laughs> I have to make myself be murdered by this slasher guy. So like, what was kind of going through your head to get ready for that? Oh, well, just being at that camp was creepy enough. Oh, that's right. You were saying you were scared to begin with. (laughs) And it was a very quiet set. You know, movies have a lot of moving pieces. Now you just have a bazillion people on set. But back then, it was only who was needed. Okay, you know, special effects makeup had to be there. Steve Miner, cameraman, you know, those people, the grips, all those guys had to be there. Okay. So when you're going up the steps and, you know, the camera's following you going up the steps, Mm -hmm. it is very quiet. Okay. So it is very creepy. Gotcha. And then he does jump out of the bed, you know, at me Mm -hmm. too. So he had to do that multiple times. And that's kind of creepy. And also, I was a really good screamer. My (laughs) husband can tell you too. No, I'm just just kidding. I have to go there. But I am a really good screamer. And I knew, I I used to dub in horror movies too. Really? Yeah. Yeah. I used to dub them in. Yeah. Once in a blue moon, my daughter will say, oh, that's you, isn't it? And I go, yep, it is. Really? Yeah. Can you give us some that you've done? Um, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> You're not allowed? <laughs> no, I mean, I did a couple of on, on ours. I did a couple on part three. I did prom night. I did something on Scream. I dubbed in somebody on Scream. Really? And then I did another one. I don't remember the name. Is that of like a, a hush thing? Do they give you credit for that? No, or? they no. don't give you credit. Oh, okay. What, okay. You, what you do is if, you know, a Scream is a Scream. Yeah. It's pretty it's a pretty serious yeah. thing and you have to really have the whole mm-hmm. fright in it and i don't know maybe because i was just so creeped out by being at the camp i was able to really do that it was like a natural thing yeah it was okay. a natural thing to be able to do do you remember how many takes you did for your kill scene for that well they were having problems with the okay so it's slow motion okay so first the, there's bill randolph that was easy <laughs> Yeah, that was easy. Right. <laughs> then there's the coming at you. Mm-hmm. You know, so of course, you know, I have to cry, you know, and I'm like, ah, mm-hmm. like that. And then it's the, ah, you know, when you see the thing. I think that I had to do three or four times okay. because the capsule in my mouth after the scream, I had to keep it in my mouth that whole time. Yeah. The way it was positioned, it wouldn't break. Gotcha. Okay. So I had to like go from the scream to moving the capsule from back here oh, wow. into my teeth because yeah, you yeah. wanted it to be all one shot. Okay. So we had to do it over, that just sounds difficult. over and over again. That just- <laughs> yeah. I dubbed in so many different projects mm-hmm. that when I had a call, I was like my third callback for a Broadway musical. Mm-hmm. And it was for the great Stephen Sondheim and Hal Prince. And I had auditioned for them and sang for them a few times. And they brought me back to read the script. They brought me back again to sing and read and dance. Mm-hmm. And the third time had been after I had done a horror movie dub and I lost my voice. Oh, wow. And he looked at me, goes, what happened to you? And I said, well, on the side, I get called in to dub in horror movies and (laughs) scary TV shows, cartoons. And he looked, he goes, that's not a very good side gig if you want to sing on Broadway. And I was like, yeah, you're right. So (laughs) needless to say, I didn't get the part, but the show opened and closed in three days. (laughs) It was one of his, it was one of his duds. (laughs) So you were fine. I was okay with that. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Do you, do you think you have any plans to do anything else in, in horror going forward or? You know, if people contact me and they're legit, you know, I wouldn't be opposed to it. Yeah. It has to be legit. And obviously it has to be a union. Yeah. It has to be approved by the union. 
uh, cause something did come up and I ran it through my union rep and she said, no. Oh, really? So I was like, yeah, okay. Yeah, I have, you have to, if, if once you're in the union, mm-hmm. you're in the union. Even if I were to retire from my union on my next birthday, which I'm not going to do, I could still work. Gotcha. But it still would have to be union because it's for life. Right. You know? Okay. Is there any, I know we're dealing with the pandemic and everything still, but is there anything coming up that you have planned or as far as conventions or another Crystal Lake tour or anything like that? No, the Crystal Lake tours are in the summer. So okay. that's not, there were rumors about um, another convention coming up. I'm mm-hmm. hoping, I think there's one in Cincinnati coming up in the spring. Okay. And I think that's another Horror Hound. That oh, okay. is such a fun convention. Oh my God. So I've, I've heard a lot about Horror Hound. They're supposed to be really good. Oh, really I, good. I fangirl at those. <laughs> I go around. You go around and meet people? Oh yeah. I look for, okay, so where's the Shining Table? Where are they? Okay, where's the Signs of the Lambs Table? Where are they? I go and I uh, fangirl. That's cool. Uh, a little bit too. Yeah. I, I was asked to do a convention once for wrestling. And uh-huh. uh, the whole time I just went around and met other people. So like... That's how I met CJ Graham the first time, and oh. uh, they had the guys from Clerks and all that. Oh, yeah. So they're like, "Oh, uh, where are you from?" I'm like, "Oh, that wrestling booth over there." But I haven't been there all day because I've just been walking around meeting all you guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you get in trouble for that. Yeah, right, right. I just use it to meet people in like horror movies. <laughs> <laughs> So I didn't actually stay at my booth. But, uh, yeah, you could get in trouble for that. Yeah, you know, they're like, yeah. you have to be at your booth. And I know I have to be at the booth, but I really want to go over there. Right, right. But yeah, so that's what I do. I'm a musician, wrestler, uh-huh. and podcast host. Obviously. So. <laughs> uh, clearly. So before I let you go, though, because this is going to be the last thing I want you to do, is uh, plug your social media, Instagram, or anything else that you might have where people can follow you so that when you are doing conventions and you're doing the Crystal Lake tours or if you do happen to be in another horror movie... <laughs> Um, or another podcast that you can promote it to everybody who's listening right now. So just let everybody know where to find you. Oh, thanks. It's so sweet. It's really easy. It's just my name, Lauren Marie Taylor, with the number one behind it, and I'm on Instagram. All right, perfect. That's, uh, that's it. Yeah, I don't. I don't. Uh, oh, yeah. I'm kind of old school about it, but uh, <laughs> I've gotten into Instagram, and I find that it's a lot of fun. And I have been. Me- that's how we met. That's right through Instagram. <laughs> so yeah, Lauren Marie Taylor with the number one. That's really me. All right, cool. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you for being here. I appreciate it. I know it was a long drive. Uh, I know it wasn't just for us, but <laughs> still, very cool of you to come by. So thank you. I appreciate and it. And thank you for having me. This has yeah. been great. You're great. Well, next time you do another horror movie, because it's going to happen. We're going to talk about it again on this podcast. Okay. And, and by the way, he's uh, eye candy. He's not bad to look at either. Oh, thank you. The preceding presentation has been brought to you by the Gear Network.